Thank you, mate. Thank you. I've got a few. It, it's on, mate. It's on. I've got a few things to hand out. Can you just take one and hand the rest on, please? Um, these are notes that I took just for myself as a potential prelude to writing a book about my time at this bank. Um, I got a bit busy and the book never really eventuated. Maybe it will when I finally decide to stop doing things. I'd like you to have a quick skim through them. There's about 17 major bullet points on that list. I don't know if I'm going to get to cover them all with you today. Those bullet points were some of the most important issues that I felt the company was trying to live its life by over the time that I was there, which is nearly 15 years. I'll probably tell a chronological story about the company. If I miss some bullet points along the way, I'd really like you to stick your hand up and say, what about this people issue? Or what about that product issue? Or why haven't you mentioned anything about marketing? Or why haven't you mentioned anything about financials and, and balance sheets and budgets and revenue gen and all that sort of stuff? Or there's a whole pile of things that go into making a company successful that you just simply can't cover in a couple of pages in a, I don't know how long this talk is going to be. It's impossible. So this little sheet here is representative of the thoughts that were uppermost in my mind, um, pretty much for the life of the company. So you'll also see that I've written on the left hand side of that sheet, three major topics. One is about the vision of the company. The other is about the product that we were building or the attributes that we were kind of like thinking about as we were building that product. And the third piece is about people. And is it any surprise to you that like the people piece is the largest by far? I'd like to make this interactive. I don't want to be a talking head here and giving you just like 30 minutes or 40 minutes or whatever it is of the history of Tyra. That's bullshit. Right? I'd rather you like, as you listen to me, if, if there's a piece of my story that resonates with you, that you want to explore a little more, then sing out, put your hand up and say, stop. Can we talk about this a little, in a little more depth? Okay. I really encourage you to do that because you know, it's, it's not just about me telling a particular story. It's about all of us actually sharing a few ideas and you know, having a cup of coffee and getting jazz for the day. Okay. So I'm not going to run down this sheet here in, in it's like numerical order. I'm going to do a bit of a chronological um, recap of life. So in 2002, December, um, I wound up a startup that I'd um, begun in Australia, which was an offshoot of a Silicon Valley based organization doing some pretty fancy stuff around no novel erasure codes. I won't even describe to you what erasure codes are, but they essentially help provide a reliable transport mechanism for data across unreliable networks. It was a great idea. We thought we we're going to shoot the lights out, you know, Five or 10 years later, bags full of money, Bahamas, yachts. It's probably a similar dream that you've all had with your own startup ventures. And um, so shuttering, that was really traumatic. When you have to lay off people, it's probably one of the worst things that you ever do in your business life. You're affecting lots of people's lives. It sucks. You see the, the pain and the hurt and the uncertainty in their lives. Um, and, and it just really hurts. In that, in that month of December, a couple of my mates who I'd been working with at Cisco um, during the 90s rocked up to my front door of the office and said, you've got some stuff for sale, have you? Like, you know, computer hardware and desks and chairs. And I said, yes. What are you doing? And they said, well, we're thinking about this like idea of starting a bank. And I said, that sounds pretty interesting. I've never done anything like that before. Can I join you guys? And they said, we'd love you to. So in uh, February, 2003, after a couple of months of like finding new digs and getting our kit sorted out, we incorporated as an entity called MoneySwitch. And we set about 
trying to build a software platform that would compete with the major banks to provide the little FPOS facilities that you see every day at the press house down the street or over at the cafe in the uni where you tap your card and whatnot. We thought that this little FPOS game, which was a, a half a trillion dollar business in terms of like money that flows through those payments every single year in this country, we thought that that was a technology play. Because when you looked out at the FPOS devices then, for any of the technologists that are in the crowd here, they were little 8-bit microprocessor devices that were assembly coded, that used serial communications that connected to X25 aggregation, uh, serial, uh, serial aggregation devices that back-ended X25 to a big mainframe. All unreliable, all slow, all expensive. And so we thought, having worked at Cisco for a long time, that we could use the internet, um, very, very high to, um, security. So again, for the technology people, we were going to use like SSL, triple DES, um, duck putt, which was a, a financial transaction security scheme to protect transactions and encrypt them. And we were going to use open source. We we're going to use Java and we we're going to use agile to try and build a bank. So one of the lessons that you'll see there is that we challenged ourselves to use a lot of new technology to build a brand new platform that would outcompete the major banks. It would drive our cost down in terms of building the platform and operating it. Yes. Was there any other bank, bank or bank in general in Australia overseas? No, we were the first bank in the world to do this. Okay. What were your inspiration from? We, um, having worked at Cisco, and here's another lesson that's going to come as well. When we worked at Cisco, we realized that trying to build software with just a, at, at the beginning was just a few thousand people, like was a very difficult problem. There was a lot of unreliability in how code was actually integrated together, how it was tested and how it was released. And so when, when code was released, we'd often see routers and switches and stuff hang, crash, whatever. And so there was a tremendous amount of effort that was put in place to try and stop those problems from occurring. And the, the single biggest problem that we had with that mechanism, that way of building software, was the waterfall nature of it. So, you, okay, big idea, program plan, functional specification, design spec, coding, test plans, release plans. And often you'd wind up with a situation where you go, do a design spec and everyone goes, that's cool, and we start coding only to realize that as we were coding, we hadn't thought about a particular design issue and it was all engine stop. And we've got to go back and rethink what we were doing. So that was probably the single biggest thing that made us decide to adopt Agile. Agile wasn't even a thing in anybody's eyes really in 2003. Um, Did you name ring Agile in retrospect? <laughs> sorry? You're just calling it Agile in retrospect. Did you even have a name for it then? It was called Agile then. Oh, okay. It absolutely was. Yeah, yeah. So there was the Agile Manifesto by Kent Beck, Martin Fowler, and a bunch of other guys that developed it. And um, the, that was the late 90s that they started. They started around 2000 with the Agile, Agile uh, practices. So, so no one was doing it. And we thought we can actually improve the reliability of our software and we can increase the velocity of what we produce and put into the marketplace at the same time. Um, and so we, so winding all the way back, agile. Okay, tick, we've got to use that. That's going to help us a whole lot. Open source. Open source is really grand because as I was starting to explain, if you only have this number of people banging away on building a software product, you'll get a certain quality. In the open source world, if you have this many people working on a product, you have infinitely more many eyes on that piece of software and they're going to help to produce a better reliability out of that product. Um, and those two things. So then uh, the third thing that we decided to use was um, essentially commodity iron, commodity server hardware. So Intel based servers, nothing fancy. It allow us to rack and stack hardware. We could do N plus one redundancy schemes that would be far cheaper than going to say IBM or any of the other like um, fault tolerant computer, computer hardware manufacturers. 
So those three things combined would allow us to build something that was high quality, robust, secure, and inexpensive to put into the marketplace. Pretty ballsy. So we all said, okay, there's three of us, we laid down 300 grand and we gave ourselves a year to try and produce something that we thought might stand a chance of getting into the market. So that's just a technology piece. Then there's the banking piece. And so we were three technologists with zero banking knowledge. And we're gonna pitch up to APRA, which is the prudential regulator in this country and say, we want a bank license. And we're gonna pitch up to the IBA and tell them how we're gonna do things and make them more reliable and therefore more trustworthy in the public's eyes. We're gonna go and talk to what was then APCA, which was the, the technical regulator in this country for the banking system. Any which way outside we were going to work, we required to read a set of manuals like this thick, suck it all down and then try and build a platform and try and educate people about all the things I just mentioned to you and make them believe that we can actually build this stuff. It was, I mean, it was really audacious. In fact, when you look at what you need to do now as a neo bank to get into business, um, you wouldn't have a hope back then of actually achieving this. You wouldn't have, I mean, we were absolutely naive and that's probably one of the other things that all you, all you guys would be familiar with. Like in order to realize a dream, you kind of have to be a bit naive about what you're going to do. Yes, sir. We, I think we were probably not only naive, but we were probably a little bit arrogant. I think there's, there's a sense that there's a healthy arrogance that you can adopt and like believe yourself that you don't need too much, like too much validation. I mean, you can get lost in the weeds with validation. I mean, you can run all the focus groups and polls that you like about you know, what you're going to build and they'll, they'll, they might tell you lots of different stories. So at some point you just have to say, I believe. If you talk to my girlfriend, she's a product person. She'll say, I'm not building any product until I do all, all the focus scripts and all the polls that I possibly can to actually weed down, prune down that product idea where we've actually got a real problem to solve and a real group of people that exhibit that problem and therefore we can go build. Well, we kind of knew what the problem was. It was easy to see. You could go into like Coles or Woolies and stand in the queue and wait for 45 seconds for a transaction to like complete 20 years ago. It sucked. So we kind of, that was, I guess, our validation. But we didn't need to go and do all this other stuff that I mentioned to prove to ourselves that we could get into business. And with the, um, uh, the naivety and the arrogance, sometimes uh, industries get into a particular paradigm to go the area that you have to go. Sometimes you've got to take those routes that, through naivety. Were there some areas there that were real game changers for you once you went down that route that dispelled the paradigm that was in the industry? Yes. So obviously you did a number of them. Absolutely. Some, some ones that were real big mistakes too, I'd imagine that you'd have to Totally, do. totally. I can give you two, I'll give you two One examples. Example yeah. uh, absolutely. So the example of what we did wrong, an example, because we did many things wrong. Um, the two things that we did wrong out of hundreds, one was technical, where we convinced ourselves that we just needed to use a layer two switching fabric in our, in our data centers to connect all the routers and switches and whatnot um, to finally fan out to the FPOS processing software and hardware. As it turns out, we didn't account for the fact that people have to support these machines. And if someone pulls a cable in a switch network, you're screwed because packets can't find their way from one machine to the next. And you know, we, in the back of our minds, we're kind of thinking, you know, we should be doing IP routing here. Like we should be building self healing networks. So if somebody does make a mistake, we're not in the shit. Um, the second thing is a people issue. It's a, there's a bullet point in here, which I mentioned in the, in the sheet you've got, which is you can scale too quickly. You can not grow fast enough. So if you don't put enough money into a business, um, in other words, drip feed it, 
you stand a very good chance of that business not succeeding because you can't devote money to either a marketing effort or a product development effort or whatever. Ours was actually hiring too quickly. At a certain point late in the stage when I was there, we went from 100 people to 300 people in about 18 months. Can you imagine the load on all the people that were there trying to support an extra 200 people coming into the organization in a space of like 18 months? Imagine that. Imagine not just the ability to transmit technical information or sales information or marketing information. So now I'm spending 50% of my time training people, maybe more, and 50% or less of my time actually doing my real job. Now I know, I know an aspect of my job is to train people and is to impart culture. Culture is seriously important. And if you don't get that right, you're screwed. So here we have 200 people coming on board. The people that are there are, are getting the shit severely because they can't do their jobs. So now you have this disaffection occurring. And then you, then you start to see some churn happening. Once you start to see churn happening in your organization, alarm bells, because what happens when you have high churn? Well, you actually start to lose an information base. You start to lose a knowledge base and then you start to lose a wisdom base. And I think I might've mentioned that somewhere in the, in the bottom of, of, the, of the people section. Because as soon as you lose wisdom, you truly are screwed. In, losing information, okay, I can possibly replace that by going to market and finding people. Um, losing knowledge, which is different to wisdom, right? That's more difficult. Um, and losing wisdom is really, really terrible. And so another people issue, I'm just, I'm diverting a bit because I'll get to the, the good example, um, is... It's an interesting diversion, by the way. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I, I'm sort of taking threads because I'm covering a few of the issues that are in the, in the, in the printout. Um, one of the goals as you're building a business is to build pools of wisdom and to join those pools of wisdom. So there might be a pool of wisdom in sales. There might be a pool of wisdom in marketing. There might be a pool of wisdom in product. And how do you join them all together? And if you can do that collectively, then the company has this amazing wisdom base that it can draw off for a very long time. So, if you have low churn, you have employees that are sticking around for a really long time. That means they get to build relationships that are very meaningful over the long term. So, you know, you can, we can go to another subject, which is about hiring. How do you hire right to make all that happen? What's the culture that, it, that exhibits to support that? Anyway, so one was technical, one was people. Good side. Now, remind me of the question again. Oh yes, got it, got it, got it. The right Here's the good thing. Yeah, yeah. Here's the good one. Um, to prove to people that we really knew what we were doing, and this happened in the early days, this is like a third year in, maybe fourth year, before we got the full bank license. We had a bank license on training wheels that was issued by Apple because we needed a training, uh, uh, bank license on training wheels so we could connect to Visa and MasterCard because MasterCard would say, you can't connect to us unless you have a bank license. But APRA, the provincial regulator said, well, you can't connect to us and you can't have a bank license unless you're members of them. So anyway, this was like, you know, Visa would kick us down their stairs, say, no way. And then we go to APRA and say, no way. And so we had to get Ian McFarlane, who was the governor of the Reserve Bank at the time to fly air cover for us and say, look guys, we're trying to promote competition and efficiency in the banking arena in Australia. Like, make, the, make this work. So we got a, a bank license on training wheels. So that's the background, here's the, here's the story. One night, we got our, our platform running, we we're shifting a dollar a night around all the major banks of Australia, just to prove that our system worked. So this was like now a settlement system, right? Like I give you, what's your name? Danny. Danny, I give Danny a dollar overnight. And in the morning she needs to see a dollar in her account goes, oh, I trust those money switch guys, which we were then called now Tyro. And Danny would say, I'm gonna switch a dollar to, what's your name? Josh, to Josh. And Josh is gonna switch a dollar back to me. And around and around we go for the 17 tier one banks in Australia participating in this settlement system. So one night at two o'clock in the morning, one of my co-founders, Peter, gets a call from a bank and says, fuck, we've just deposited 50 million bucks into your account. <laughs> and we go, we know, our software told us. And we, by the way, we've actually sent you a return record refusing this $50 million. 
And they went, we know. How do you know? Our systems crashed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So what we had done, we, so here's, here, and here's another backdrop to this piece. It's bloody funny. In Australia, up until that, up until 10, maybe 12 years ago, there was a guy that sat in the Reserve Bank called the National Collator. The National Collator sat at a green baize desk with a desk lamp and five fax machines and a spreadsheet. And every night at nine o'clock, every tier one bank would fax in their settlement numbers. Like, what's your name? Richie. Richie, Richie you owe me 150 million, but I owe you 130 million. Hang on a sec, that's not right. We should actually be all adding up. What I owe you and what you owe me, it should be all, all, all the same. And so the collator would go, okay, ANZ, Westpac, NAB, Combank, da 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 And they say, this is what we owe, this is what we think we're owed. So on the, on the rows, you've got all these banks. And on the, vertical, on the columns, you've got the same banks, ins and outs. If they match, the collator says, beauty, you guys can settle. And if they don't match, you guys figure it out in the next hour or two, then come back to me with another fax and I'll update my spreadsheet. And if you can't figure it out then, we're gonna settle for the least amount of money that you guys think you owe each other and you can sort it out tomorrow. This was a completely manual operation, right? And we're talking about, about 10 years ago. Oh yeah. <laughs> you guys don't know. Nobody in Australia knows what was going on at the central bank of this country dealing with your money. It was nuts. <laughs> and and so, so we, we basically said, this is crazy. Like, why can't we, this should be done in, this should have been done in software 30 years ago, but no. I mean, we used to send settlement records to them and in some of the fields for your software guys out there, it would have tape number, real number in the records as if, you know, this used to be called a courier service and it was called a courier service explicitly because tapes would be put on the backs of, of guys riding around motorbikes from one bank to another. Are you crazy? This is madness and you're still, you're still referencing these fields and it's 2010, come on. So we had one bank shifting a dollar around and we got 50 million and we, re we returned it back. Three weeks later, we got 30 million from another bank and exactly the same thing happened. So we were doing agile we were doing open source, we were doing Java, we were doing internet. And so we went to APRA and said, we want to educate you guys about all these things that we believe will make a better, stronger bank. And they said, we think we believe you now because of these two things. Because we had written software that produced predictable and reliable results automatically. <laughs> what were we thinking? <laughs> you know those Bahamas and those mo and those yachts? Yes, sir. Were you ever concerned at any point in doing that in uh, exposing some of your secret sauce? Like, were you ever worried that you'd be able to make jump straight on that and throw money at it? I've got to tell you that at certain points in time, we thought about open sourcing the whole damn lot. We were using a, we were using a, a several open source packages. One of them was called JPOS, Java POS. Um, and some of the frameworks we, we used, not a lot of it, but some of it because it helped us to build connections to um, other banks. But I, I have this dream one day that I could build a bank where I would completely open source the whole stack. Because that would just drive down the economics of, of you know, operating a bank enormously. And then you have like tens of thousands of people banging away on an open source banking platform. Hallelujah. Um, cause at the moment, if you want to build a bank, even a neo bank, you've got to go to SAP, you've got to go to Hogan, you've got to go to ECI and spend millions. And guess what? If you're a little bank in the South Pacific on a tiny Island that says, I'm trying to build a bank and you're at ACI in New York on the 54th floor of whatever skyscraper they're in, please, please. Can you make a, a modification that's core to my business operation? If I don't have it, we won't, we won't be in business. I say, get lost, you're 200th on our list because I've got Wells Fargo that's banging on my door who's, who's infinitely more valuable to me as a customer. Which is a major reason why we decided to go build our own proprietary platform. We could build our own special source, but we weren't reliant 
on external resources that are essentially a threat to us. That's the good. That's the good story. So, if I'm being, by being outsiders, like being non-banking people, gave you a massive advantage. I think that's one of the most important things that attributes that we had going for us. Yes, it allowed us to think differently, completely differently. We weren't constrained by any old sort of 1980s, 1990s thinking about how banks should actually operate. Not just the infrastructure, how it should operate, but how the product should work and how we should market it and how we should sell it and how we should present ourselves to the marketplace, to the customer base. Do you end up hiring banking people? And Unfortunately, we did have to. <laughs> yes. And it was, it was actually um, correctly enforced on us by the regulator. At some point, like, it's, it's fine to be a technologist and it's fine to read like stacks of manuals about you know, how to do banking right. But at some point, if you're dealing with deposits and loans and stuff and you don't understand bank bill swap rates, you know, and, and you don't understand um, floating rate notes, and how they're used, um, and you don't understand um, financial risk, you need help. So we weren't so proud that we said, oh, yeah, we're gonna let it all. You just can't, You're like, you, you, know, you actually have to hire people that really know that stuff inside out. So yes, we were forced to hire banking people. Our mandate to ourselves was to hire as few banking people as we could for as long as we could, until we realized that we needed really good general counsel in banking and we re needed really, really good financial people in banking. But all the rest of it, we could pretty much do without banking people. And uh, unfortunately, you kind of run into a cultural problem where the more banking people that you bring in, they bring their people with them. And suddenly you've now got an organization that wasn't what it was 15 years ago. It now looks like you know, a mid-sized bank with bank people in it. And so you have this cultural clash of the people that were here right from the very beginning, they say, we're with Peter and Andrew and Paul, screw you, we know what we're doing. You know? And you got people over here, they kind of say, yeah, but I know better. I've had 10 years deep in the bank. You know, I've got all this experience, why aren't you listening to me? And so these guys over here, they say, but I want to run 10 second, 100 meters every, all the time. And these guys kind of go, oh man, you know. 10 seconds and 100 meters, that's too much. Like, okay, go slow. We're, we're trying to manage risk here. So you can, this cultural kind of like clash has to be resolved somehow. So how are you gonna do that? Which is another story. Um, so I've gotten to, I've covered some people issues. I've covered some product issues. I've covered some vision issues, I think. Let's go to, the, to the, some of the people issues. Um, if you're going to start a business as a sole founder, that is super hard because the whole world rests on your shoulders. And it's, unless you have a very good support network for yourself, it's almost impossible. You, know, you go to bed at night alone with your thoughts and your concerns. Starting a business with two people can be tricky. Starting a company with three people is often much better. Um, we started with three people and I think it worked because we'd been together for seven years, 10 years, 20 years. So we knew what each other was like when we started the game. Not only did we know each other well, but we'd worked with each other for a long stretch. So we kind of knew the strengths and the weaknesses of each of, each of us. So. I was a technical guy cutting code for the first five years. So I said, Andrew, okay, you do that. Peter, you're a genius at, at engineering design. You lead the whole engineering effort. Paul, you're a business development guy. You're a genius at that. You understand engineering, but you understand business development and how to translate really good engineering ideas into working product. You do that. And by the way, you can wear the CEO hat for a while. So that was a really good kind of like, separation of duties and we trusted each other like implicitly 
that was probably the key thing where each one of us could, could simply allow the other person to do their thing without us having to worry at all. Um, so I think that's probably one of the most important pieces of advice I could give to anyone who wants to start a business is like going solo is really, really hard. Going duo is much, much better. Going trio is the best. Seriously. And because if one founder decides to disappear, well, you've still got that too. Yeah. I, mean, I was going to say business development gave me the concept of uh, the people connections and the marketing and so on, but you, your definition was sort of a different before. Um, that part of it is so important, not only for internal development of staff, but the relationships with all those regulators and so on. Yeah. But who was the front person that really forged those, or was it the reputation of the three of you that opened the doors? Um, I can't, we, we didn't have a reputation, reputation to begin with that kind of came way later that came with success. You know, people say, Oh, you're a, you're a 12 year company, oh, but you're, you, you succeeded overnight. No, no, no. We've been going for 12 years, 15 years, whatever. We, we had to rely on our own smarts and ability to translate engineering ideas into working product and show how that positively affected the banking system in Australia. That's why I say we used to go to APRA. And we would educate them on why Agile was so bloody good. So it wasn't just about those two examples that I gave you about in the bad thing, the good thing. Um, it's also about showing how to mitigate risk in operating a banking platform where you say, you know what, we're doing Agile. I don't care whether you're XP or Scrum, whatever. But if you can show you deliver software in shorter and shorter increments, then you're only emitting smaller and smaller change into your banking platform, which is controllable. That was one of the single most important things that we could show them. Um, I'm going to ask people if they've got any particular points on that sheet or others that they want to talk about. I want to circle back to what you're saying about how hey, you've got like the, the original people. Yes. So like the, it's the war front uh, climate, uh, culture climate. But yeah. You've got the new people, it's kind of like the cold front, sort of like yeah. the clash of cultures. Yeah. <laughs> Having the three founders knowing each other, it sounds like you understand how to handle conflicts with each other well, we are able to translate some of the skills to like handle conflicts with the greater culture and how to handle that, or that just you walk away from it. Well, everyone you can't walk away from it, right? That's death. You, you have to meet it head on. Um, the only way you can really, these people over here can't live in this world anymore. If, if you want to live in this world, you kind of better go and find another home. Yep. The company is moving on, necessarily moving on. Now, some people can't make that, that transition from a startup environment. Some people can't last a company more than 50 people in size. They go, this is driving me crazy. Like you're forcing me to do a lot of things I don't want to do. You know, whether it's a software engineer that now has to be responsible for other people transmitting culture, transmitting information, transmitting wisdom. I said, no, no, all I want to do is fucking cut code. And they said, I'm out of here. Um, and other people, other people will say, you know what? I'm willing, to, I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to actually reshape my role to benefit myself, but to benefit the company. Um, and so you've got to, if you want to stick around with this vision that hopefully you believe in, You've got to start slowly, slowly walking. And that's what you have to teach people to do. And I mean, I was able to do that until I got to my sort of breaking point, which was about 400 people. Um, and, and it wasn't really about the size of the company. Then it was actually about the relationship I had with the CEO. Um, but if you can, if you can take people on a journey of, of um, changing their role a little bit, so that they become now not just like this individual contributor in, and I'm just using the software engineer piece as an example, because that's how I started in the organization or as a salesperson, because I transitioned from engineering to sales. That's another story. Someone can someone burn that into their brain and ask me in I don't know, five or 10 minutes time about like going from software to sales. Richie, can you remember that? Yeah. yeah. So that was the question I was actually asking about the business. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll get to that, but let's finish this piece here because you must take people on this journey. Otherwise you're not going to succeed. Now I'm not saying that you have to come all the way over here 
you don't want to get here too quickly because you'll lose everybody. Except for, bring them. And you have to bring these people back this way. Right? You, have to, you have to show them that there's a better way of running a business than the way they've been used to in the past. So that requires lots and lots of tricks. I mean, we could spend a whole day just talking about that. Um, and it's not an easy, it's not an easy task. And the, the, the senior management in the company are ultimately responsible for making sure that happens. Tangentially to that, one of the ways I found um, to bring people along for that ride is to encourage people migrating between departments. So we can get to your point now. Um, Bingo. Absolutely. That's one of the most important things that you can do in a company is to make Josh, and I'm going to just say you're a software engineer, understand Richie's world in customer support. Because Richie's sitting here taking phone calls from IRA customers all the time going, Josh. And I'm over here like, that's a feature. <laughs> right? And so Josh, as, as, as your manager, I'm going to say, why don't you go and spend a day tagging along with Richie and see what his problems are that he faces every single day. Because you, you can listen to his calls and the IRA customers banging away on him because he, he's absorbing all this energy, negative energy coming his way. And, and then Richie's going to say, okay, the mic and the headphones are yours. And now you're going to take the calls. And you're a software engineer. And what's the sort of personality type for a software engineer? Kind of introverted, maybe? Don't want to talk to too many people? You're freaking out. I actually did that at a startup, and eight out of 10 problems um, that we're getting calls for, we fixed in a week. And so now we come to Richie, yeah. right? And Richie, you know, mother. <laughs> Richie, I want you to come over and sit with Josh and see the issues that he faces when he's trying to build software. You know, Rich, Josh here is having to do pair programming and he bloody hates it because he says, I don't have my own think time. You know, I'm sitting here with another person who I might be training out and he says, I could run 10 times faster if I didn't have this person sitting next to me having to like do information tr transmission. But that's his job, right? Because we're growing up as a company. We're trying to impart knowledge and wisdom. Trying to get more software engineers. Trying to get more software engineers. And you go, I didn't realize it was that hard. He's got a whole heck of a lot on his plate. Hasn't he? So now at the end of that day, we do that once a, once a month. So now you understand Richie's world and Richie understands your world. And hopefully, as you rightly pointed out earlier, we build empathy for each other in the organization. Now you can do that. So the, the best, the best um, junction points to do that are sales and customer support. They're the worst with each other. They truly are. Like a salesperson's got some targets to hit. And, and Richie, if, he, if he's not doing a really good customer support job, the sales guy, he's going to lose his job because he's not meeting his targets. Like, screw you. But, but Richie has got the shit with the sales guy. What's your name? I'm Richie too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. R1, R2. <laughs> R2D2. <laughs> um, so Richie too is a sales guy and, and you're the customer support guy and, and you're going, you mother, you're making my life hell. You're signing up all these customers that should not have this product. And I'm happy to tell them that they shouldn't have it and stop terminate. And you're going, I just lost my Christmas bonus. Mm. Right. That's the, that, that, not, that nexus there is the worst. And then the next one is between product and Yes, product and marketing. That's the next worst one. <laughs> See, we, I mean, I don't know how long I've been spending talking here now, but you, we could decompose culture between organizations all day long, and it will be fun, <laughs> but we've got other things to talk about. Um, okay, so next. basically you were saying about software into sales and marketing. Yeah, so, so, touched on now. yeah so it's this empathy, right? It's empathy between sales and customer support. Engineering, customer support, product, marketing. 
once you build those bridges and make it easy for people to understand other people's lives, I can build, so what's your name? David. David. Yeah. David's a product guy. <laughs> David's sitting in the corner there very quietly, which is unusual for a product person. But he, he, he's sitting there going, I can't build a product. I can't launch a product unless I'm in tight with the marketing people and I'm in tight with Richie too here because you know, he's an essential part of my go-to-market strategy. You, you build all those bridges and you allow people the free exchange of their talents between each other, the information, and therefore the knowledge and ultimately the wisdom. Do you see what I'm saying now? Like we talked earlier on about information, knowledge and wisdom, but this is, an, this is a concrete example of how you can do it. And, and this goes to culture, right? This, this is about transparency of how we do our thing every single day in the company. I use the same thing at Leap. Sorry? I use the same model at Leap Legal. Okay. So when I ran the main documents product, and I found some of my support people who I bought work with the engineers, they became engineers, brilliant engineers, and really fit to go out and do on-site support. So you find talent. Yeah, and, and here's the rub with all of this like information and people exchange and a generating of like collective wisdom. When you have that collective wisdom, what do you think happens at the very top of the, at the top of the organization all the way through to, you know, people on the floor? What do you think happens when that everyone has got a piece of that wisdom? It becomes an iron in the common who said cohesive? Yes. Anything else? You have trust. Yes. Yes. Alignment of common values. And anyone that sits outside those values are the ones that are going to jump ship. Talk to me more about alignment. Uh, alignment's a common understanding of, uh, in many instances, the values are uh, intrinsic already in the individual. And they've been looking for a group that actually espouses those values so they feel uh, purposeful. And Perfect. Yeah. So, so, David, was it? Yeah. So, David. I, let's, let's be a compass, big compass. So David now has an understanding of the North Star of the company. Josh has the same North Star, even he's a product guy, he's a software guy. Richie, one, also has the same North Star as it applies to his role in customer support. Richie, two, has the same North Star as it applies to him in sales. That is so important because now any one of you who are publicly facing for the company can talk a story essentially in a single phrase or a single sentence to say what it is we do, why we exist. And if you're trying to attract talent, that's super important. If you're trying to attract customers, you have to be able to tell an elevator pitch story very quickly, right? Richie too has got 10 seconds maybe on the phone and the tone of his voice to get another 30 seconds. In that 30 seconds, he's got to be able to tell a short story about why we exist and what we're doing to get two minutes. And if he gets two minutes, he's probably got a chance of getting further in terms of a, a contract. So you're revealing your sales experience now. So maybe we can talk about the engineering for sales. Okay. So I did engineering for five years in the company. And I've been doing engineering for probably 20 years before that. So I was an assembler coder, I, I dabbled in COBOL, PL1, Pascal, Fortran, you name it, I had done it at, at, in Boston and in San Francisco and Sydney. Um, so I was looking for a different role in a company. I just didn't want to be a software engineer. And I thought, we're getting to this point here now where the product's in market and we've really, really got to start driving sales. So I thought, I can talk. I'm reasonably charismatic. I know my product really, really well. Why don't I have a crack at pounding the pavements and knocking on doors and seeing what I can do? The worst that could possibly happen is that I fail. And so this is, this is a really good exercise in, in extending yourself beyond what you think you can do and experimenting and be willing to actually fail. You know, it's another bullet point in, I think the, the, um, people section. Be willing to experiment. Be willing to fail. Be willing to push yourself beyond what you think you can possibly do. So I did all of that. So I would actually go to, I, my first go-to customers were surf shop owners because I'm a surfer. 
and so I would, I would go and crawl under like cabinets, um, you know, point of sale system, the computer would be sitting on the top of a cabinet. There'd be this little FPOS device sitting on the side. I'd pull open the cabinets and there'd be this rat's nest of wires and dust and fucking coffee cups and other chip packets. And how does this thing actually work? Why hasn't there been a fire here? You know? <laughs> Retailers are notoriously poor at managing infrastructure. It just gets shoved under the doors, under the, under the countertop, close the doors, everything's nice and neat and tidy. Countertop looks schmick, but underneath it looks an abomination. And so, so what I did, what, what really, really worked was not necessarily just putting the FPOS device in there, integrated into their point of sale system, providing a slicker experience. It was actually doing IT support. What I was really selling for a year or two was IT support about rebuilt, ripping out old infrastructure and putting in new networks. And I would, for every single customer, I would do an A4 sheet network diagram and say, if you've got problems, call me up. Cause I would have all the diagrams with me as well. So now I can go, Oh yeah. Hey, Hey Paul, it's slimes in Erina. Like your network looks like this. I think your problem might be here. And sure enough, that was likely to be the cause. So that was IT support. They would actually call me up and do that. say, could you put a voice system in for me? I did. I did all those things just to actually make them trust me that I knew about their network, that I knew about their, their um, FPOS system. Or I knew more than that. So for two years, I kind of did that. And I realized that's not a scalable method to build lots of customers. So the next thing to do was, all right, so I'd actually shifted away now, right, from engineering proper after two years. I thought I was pretty good. I was like signing up all these surf shops up and down the coast of New South Wales and Victoria and Queensland and Western Australia. And I'm going, right, I'm not flying to Tasmania anymore. I'm not flying to Western Australia. I'm just gonna sit in Sydney. I'm gonna start developing partnership relationships, which hadn't really been done in the banking system up until that point. So I created a, a systematic blueprint of working with point of sale companies. These are the companies that provide restaurants, for example, with their table management systems that you can then tie the FPOS device to. And there are lots of point of sale manufacturers in the country, but if I could leverage their sales force to help sell my product, then I instantly scale myself one to however many salespeople there are in that organization, five, 10, whatever. So I, I made a cookie cutter um, process and I signed up a hundred point of sale partners and each one of them was now delivering five or 10 accounts a month. So suddenly we went from, you know, 10, 20 contracts a month to like 50, 60, 70 contracts a month for relatively no effort. I mean, now I had to pay them a kickback because they're kind of gone, well, I'm not going to do this for free. Am I like, what's in it for me? It's like, oh, okay. So that's when like trailing commissions came up. Now in the Royal Commission, trailing commissions are abhorrent, right? So before the Royal Commission came, we actually had to say to ourselves, the regulators aren't allowing us to, you know, hand trailing commissions out to, <clears throat> to point of sale partners. And not only that, but they can't issue like financial advice to their customers. Fair enough. But what we had to do was like call our trailing commission a support fee. Like these guys are actually like taking our product, they're integrating into their software base. They have to still do more software support and whatnot. So let, let's just call it that. But as it turns out, the bigger you get, the larger that like trailing commission pie is. And when I left, it was about 6 million bucks annually. Pretty hefty, right? So how do you actually wean people off a pretty decent like trailing commission? That's hard. I left, I didn't have to figure that problem out. <laughs> Okay. Um, so engineer, direct salesperson, channel development, classical channel development. And by the time I got up, up to sort of two, three years of channel development, um, the former head of sales left the company and the CEO said, well, why don't you do it? And I actually, and I actually said, I want to do it before he even like told me, I said, I want to do this. I can, I can do this. And that was again, like completely naive. Like I had no idea about truly how to run a sales organization. I knew how to manage people a little bit, but I'd essentially been a single contributor for the company, even though I was the co-founder for a long, long time. So to step into that role was, oh my God, 
okay, I have to understand all the people that are, I'm responsible for. <laughs> um, that was probably the biggest challenge for me to try and understand everybody's motivations and why they were at Tyro. I mean, I had my motive, my, my ideas and my motivation, but did I truly understand Richie's? No. So now I'm having like cups of coffee with everyone trying to understand where their heads are all at. You mentioned the thing about structure and you're a co-founder, so you must have a board with a director and so on, but you're also in operations that report to your CEO. Yes. So what we, and I've actually just spoken to two organisations that have a similar thing where the chairman of the board is actually in operations. So um, what were some of the things that caused you some grief in regards to being a co-founder trying to get the direction that you've advocated the responsibility of CEO and CEOs and so on to drive the business? So that involved lots of bottles of red wine and lots of arguments late at night. So when everyone else went home, there would be the two co-founders because Paul, the, the guy who had the original idea for the business left in 2006 in essentially what was a founder crisis. That happened because the CEO that we brought in, Josh Stolman, had one idea of, of what he thought the company should be and how it should operate versus Paul who had another idea. And the essential rub there was, Paul believed Tyra should be the Southwest Airlines of payments in Australia. Everyone knows Southwest Airlines? On time, you get a boarding card that seats 1 to 30, 30 to 60, and, and so on. But they're on time, they take off on time, they land on time, they're super reliable, and they're cheapest chips. So he, Paul thought that's what we should be, like a very low-cost entrant that just does what we say. And on the other hand, Yoss is going, no, 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 we're high-touch, we provide value-added transactions that the customers will pay a premium for. And not only that, but we're going to position ourselves as sort of the boutique operator that you come to if you want this high-grade customer support, high-grade product, high, high touch. And, and that conflict emerged in lots of different ways, most especially in marketing and PR, um, but sometimes even in product. And it ultimately led to a boardroom clash, a found a crisis because we clashed you know because because part of us thought we don't want to side with paul because paul had the former chairman of the company who had a vested interest in flicking it to combank he says we can flick it for a billion dollars back in 2006 screw you no way because we all thought we want to build this as a standalone business that runs for 100 years not to be sold to a major bank where suddenly the whole competitiveness and efficiency piece has been lost. Um, so that happened. Um, but like fast forwarding, so once we sort of decided that, okay, we want the business to run for the long term, we're willing to work as a sort of boutique operator for a while and charge a premium um, to build good cash flow when we can then take that product to the masses kind of like Elon Musk has done with, with Tesla, right? Like Elon Musk made cars for wealthy people, right? They were expensive, didn't he? Right? And they're bleeding money. Now, fortunately, he was in a position to fund that thing majorly for his first several years of life. But look at the stock price now. Look at, what, look at the numbers they've just announced for like the S3 um, and the other, other models. And the profit, it's been, the numbers of the cars they've shipped have been phenomenal. And their stock price just hit 900 bucks today. And there are some analysts who say it's going to be $7,000 in 2024. Right? So we were kind of, we had a similar thinking, you know, build premium product. If we, if the merchants are willing to build, uh, to, to pay that price, that product, then we can start to go down, 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 down. You get economies of scale and suddenly that same product can be had by everyone. Um, there's a bullet point. That's class customer paying for the economy stick. Yeah, but ultimately, there's a whole story about like back book pricing and front book pricing, which we could also talk about. But again, it's uh, you know limited time. Um, there was a bullet point somewhere that actually I just reminded myself of around what was it? Andrew, um, at what point? How did you engage with? I mean, you've got some of the biggest competitors in in Australia. Yeah. The most resource powerful. It's quite you pretty much. Yeah. At any point, how did you engage with them? Did you? Did you attack them? Did you try to stay under the radar for as long as possible? Yes, the latter. The latter. So uh, we, we, tried to, we tried to work with them. Initially, like, in order to be in the game of processing payments, you actually have to connect to these players. 
So we had to connect to NAB, we had to connect to ComBank, and we had to, but they didn't want us to connect. Cool. So they would use two strategies against us. Number one was they would say, yeah, well, we know that McFarlane at the Reserve Bank wants, you, wants us to connect to you, but it's gonna take us two years to get to you and it's gonna cost you a quarter of a million to do the interconnect. Well, two years and a quarter million dollars for a startup is nonsense, like we'll be out of business. And that's what they wanted. Um, and then even when we did get connected, um, they were, we, we were frightened every day that the CBA and ANZ would have a price war and we would be the collateral. What they were really doing was saying, we're going to price you out of the market, get lost. But we were actually able to build very sticky relationships with merchants. Like we, we could show them that this product actually did save them money. We could show them that this did improve efficiency in their businesses. So the product was actually singing and speaking for itself. And that was a thing that really saved us. You know, we had this thing called easy claim, which is a Medicare facility, which allows you to get your money back from your Medicare claim into your account right there. And then, so when you walk out the door, you can spend that cash. And that was a real hit. And that taught us about product differentiation a lot, a lot, a lot. Once you can show really good product differentiation and stickiness, and then you get customer loyalty and trustworthiness, then you get this sort of viral like word of mouth thing happening. And you know, I used to have people as a salesperson, I used to have my surf shops, they would be, and because they were all operating in local communities, they would just tell all their friends, why aren't you on Tyro? These guys are fantastic. Their product is great. They do what they say. Their customer support is good. The product's rock solid. And that gave us that virality to combat these guys. But we didn't try to poke the bear too much. You know, there's this fine line. This is a really good point also. There's a really fine line between um, being the sort of maverick and the renegade and railing against the banking system because it's rapacious and being a, a really sharp, nuanced operator that says, we think, we think the banking system can do with improvement and here's how we're trying to do it. The messages are very, very different. One is like, I'm gonna try and bash you on the head, you made your bank, you'll just get killed. And the other one is, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna speak about the banking system in general and we're gonna show how we can potentially improve it. So you, you just gotta avoid poking the bear. So that, that nuanced conversation, that nuanced PR is vitally important. Like my, my former CEO was like, he wanted to poke the bear all the time. <laughs> He's like, don't, please don't do that. You know, let's fly under the radar a little bit more. Let's get a few more thousand customers under our belt before we go crazy. change of industry, um, new tech coming in and so on. Was there, outside of the, the 50 mil, 30 mil situation, some of those other things, if you look back on the journey, is there any other critical past where there was a change out there that happened that gave you the leg up? To yes, the 100%. Yeah. 100%. Can you give us two or three that just... I'll give you one really big one. Yeah. So you guys remember when that whole chip, chip and pin thing came through? Where, you know, at a restaurant, Previously, you would put your card on the plate and it'd be taken away and you go, mm. and if I was in Chinatown, I don't want to cast aspersions, but mm, I'm not feeling good. Along comes this chip and pin mandate with these EM, EMV cards, where suddenly you've got a microprocessor on your card and you can insert it and that the unit has to come to the table or I actually have, physically have to go to that FPOS device and put my pin in. So suddenly now you've got an improvement in security around your card and the transaction but it's a bit of a pain in the ass like you're making me get up and walk to a till please let me stay at the table and have one last sip of my wine why can't you bring the unit to the table and i can pay there then i can give you a tip if i'm feeling really good or i can or the merchant can do a surcharge if it's a public holiday or i can do currency conversion because you know what i'm a tourist and i've got a swedish krona like issued card it's like would you like to pay in swedish kronos Sure, this ease of functionality, we were able to build into the product. So I could now, which I did, I could go to Justin Hems at Maryvale and say, hey mate, I've got this product that will allow you to have higher staff retention rate 
and therefore better customer service for your patrons in your locations. And you say, how do you do that? Oh, by the way, I can say, I'll also make you more money. Justin's going, okay, show me the money. So I say, all right, well, if I'm providing a, a pay at the table solution where, sorry, I forgot your name again, Deb, Deb. I come to Deb and I say, Danny. Deb, oh, sorry, Danny, Danny's, <laughs> Danny, Danny did spend 250 bucks, but now she spent 50 because I got a name wrong. <laughs> Danny says, okay, I put the unit at the table. I just walk away. And Danny's having a glass of wine with her friends, finishing up because, you know what? That was a great experience for me. And now I can just pay at my leisure, you know, and I can privacy, la, la, la. You feel good. So that tip, instead of being 5%, it might be 10%. Yahoo. She gives me the thing back. I walk away. I go to Richie. I hand the FBOS device over to you and you have a similar experience. You might actually decide to get up earlier and go, or you might stay later, but I can show you in a fast moving restaurant. I can show you that I can flip that table one more time that, during the day. And if there's 40 tables in that place and you on average spend 50 bucks, there's $2,000 extra in top line for that venue. And by the way, Richie's had a better experience because the customer service has been great. So now Richie's actually inclined to give a better tip. And how does that help out? Well, okay, the staff are happier. They're getting more tips. Suddenly the manager or the owner of the business says, you know what, I've got better staff retention because people are sticking around longer. That's good. I don't have as many hassles to worry about. So I've got more time to spend on other parts of my business. So good customer support, a service, better paying customers. Um, flipping one more table. So they're all the advantage of this little product, right? So Justin goes, you beauty. And guess what? Justin's willing to pay a premium for that service because he can see three advantages at least of a tiny little product feature. So that's, so, so that's a really good, so that, and that was all around chip and pin, that transition from the old school to new school. So it's all about trying to uh, see ahead of what changes are going to happen in your industry and go, how can I leverage that? That's the key. Early in the conversation, you talked about um, startup culture and the bank culture. And so there's got to, there's, at some point, you have to know the business of being a bank, what it means to be in that industry. And that brings cultural change, you also get in corporatization because it's, you know, 300, 400 people. Is there a tipping point or did it just flow? I think... And then one day you were back to another startup. I think it happened quickly for us because we hired quickly. You know, like I said, we went from 100 people to 300 people in the space of probably 18 months. And the regulator as we, you know, we got a full bank license, as we were becoming a full bank issuing um, loans and taking deposits, we needed more financially literate people in a company. Um, that sort of, that was a big bank for us. If prior to that, we were still, we had like a couple of financially literate, I mean, our CFO, obviously, um, our chief risk officer, for sure, a little bit of our internal audit person, um, and then Peter, the, the other co-founder, and Yost a little bit. So there was probably a handful of people that were financially literate that was able to guide the company from that perspective. After that, um, you know, we needed a treasury function because now I've got deposits on this side and I've got loans on this side and they need to be able to, they're, they're the sort of powerhouse. They're the guys that basically set interest rate differentials. So the net interest margin, they are in control of. Suddenly now you have people that are dealing with financial risk and dealing with liquidity, all these other issues that us techies, you know, kind of, my head was spinning. It's like, I don't want to know about that. I just want to build product. I want to sell product. So it was non, essentially non-existent for a long while. Then there was a few people. Then there was this big bang of people. And that was a time when we introduced so many people and we were essentially like takers of talent because there were so many people, um, so many companies looking for talent, you know, everyone would say, we've got the best workplace in the world. We've got the most talented people in the world, like come work with us. It's like, it was a lie. Everyone can say, 
you know, we're a world-class outfit. Very few companies are. And so when you're, when you're a taker of talent, um, you're not world-class, you're kind of middle-class. And so you try and do the best with middle class. And, you, and this is where the culture and the education piece is really, really important. Like how do you bootstrap them up to be something much, much more than they thought they could be? So yeah, it, was, it wasn't linear. It was more like that. And that's where a lot of people kind of went, you know what, I'm out of here. Because the people that we, the people that we got here, they truly were exceedingly talented. And then they got to this point and they went, oh, I can't do this anymore. I just can't. It's too hard. You know, I want to go back to that place. So they went to Canva. You know. they, they went to Atlassian. They went to CultureAmp. They went to um, Campaign Monitor. You know, that startups that were served 10 years after us, but and they were trying to find that old ground again. Um, and some stayed. But yeah, it's, it, it's a an inevitable thing and it's very hard to at scale build the whole company up in terms of really really top grade talent in the end i found over the decades that you have let's just pick josh's engineering team like you have one absolutely standout like software engineer who's just an utter genius but pretty ineffective when it comes to communication but the designs are impeccable then you have two really top grade software engineers that completely understand josh um, and they can translate his inability to like communicate and his ideas into everyday language that the other software engineers who are, who are competent and they're the guys and girls that are actually like cutting code and building product. So you wind up with a, a team structure that's one genius, two really highly, highly talented people and a few that are competent around them to get your stuff done. And that's, that's what you actually live with. So how do you make that work? How do you make that really sing? Answer your question? No? Yeah, I'd answer the question. You kind of, you know, you hit, you hit a wall. We hit a wall. Yeah. We totally hit a wall. Because you see that time and time again as we wonder if yeah. there's any smooth transitions. I haven't experienced that in my life. And, yeah, and it seems to me that you're either the temperament And and think of it this way, think of it this way, like the people over here, when you're starting a business, it's highly volatile. There's so many unknowns. It's far less certain that the thing is going to work. So you've got to be able to entertain that uncertainness about your existence in this organization because the organization might not exist in three months or six months or 12 months, you know, you're reliant on somebody to go out and attract funding, you know, to keep the thing, to keep the lights on. And so people that are here actually, they don't just accept it. They thrive on that. They want to create order out of chaos. They want to build product. They want to build a company out of essentially nothing. They just understand the cause and the desire to change something. The people over here, at the very end, what do you think they're like? Well, I don't know what they're like. <laughs> so they, they, they want certainty, right? Yeah, they, want, they want the job role completely prescribed for them. Here's a set of responsibilities I need to execute on to get my job done, to get a salary increase. And, and so I can get a paycheck in the bank so I can put a house over my family and feed them. And that's okay too, right? But they're two very different types of people. And then there are some that are sort of in between. They'll entertain a little bit of risk because they think, you know what, I might get a bit more reward. And there are people that are sitting over here going, mm, no, I want more safety. And, and, and that's inescapable as well. But how do you have people here who, who are entrepreneurial and take big risk and transition them through to the center piece where they're, they're sort of still satisfied by this part, but they know that they have to live with this part. Bingo. And that's what I had to do. You know, I realized that my life, uh, 
the very words that I said to the executive management and the board when I left was, as an individual, everyone has their own phase of life, phases of existence. And companies have their own phases of existence. And for a time, those phases are in lockstep and everything's grand. But when they're out of lockstep, it's time to move. You know, and it's generally the individual that moves because the company is that much bigger. And so I moved. And it does, you're right, you're absolutely right. People need to understand who they are and what their role in an organization is and when their time's up. Politicians. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think on that bump, we'll wrap it up, we'll wrap it up here. But have you got a few minutes to stick around? I'm sure people have more, yeah, more sure. questions over, over breakfast. And yeah, yeah. Was that, was that useful, informative, helpful? Yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I just say a point? Sure. Uh, and hopefully I'm speaking on behalf of a lot of people here. I've seen a lot of speakers in that. But the way that you've opened up with this particular sheet, which basically has laid down a platform, I've not seen anyone do that before. And then share your story in that, which then you can relate back to various aspects. Yeah. It's probably one of the most educational business sessions that I've ever been to. Well, so thank, thank you. you. That's great. That's really good to hear. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah.